Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. You know what? F*** what that documentary tells you. The ruthless aggression era was really weird and uncomfortable all of the time. At least the Attitude Era was in the 90s, that part of grotty pop culture history that we've all hermetically sealed off where gay bashing, transphobia and dreadful leather coats were all given a mainstream pass. But in some ways, the ruthless aggression era was so much worse for the fact that it was horrendous bollocks presented with slightly more mainstream polish. The Attitude Era was like a 12-year-old who pulls down his trousers, says, look at this, and giggles. The ruthless aggression era was like a 48-year-old who pulls down his trousers, says, look at this, and giggles. There's a lot in this era that tries to be funny. Vince's War on God, HLA, Hornswoggle, f***ing Eugene, Katie Vick, Snitsky causing Lita's miscarriage. That was played for last, let's not forget. All, literally all of John Cena's rapping being gay jokes. Finding 10 moments of actual comedy in this era that didn't punch down in any way was a goddamn struggle, but they're there just. These are the 10 funniest WWE moments of the ruthless aggression era. Number 10, who did I just beat? Good God almighty talk about a burial. Mike Knox was a big tough dude, but without anything really going on beyond a diet Mark Mero, stop looking at my pretty girlfriend gimmick. With his momentum seemingly stalled, WWE mercilessly fed him to DX in a way that was absolutely hilarious. Sorry, Mike. It was Team DX versus Team Rated RKO at Survivor Series in a traditional five on five. The match starts with Mike Knox telling Triple H to stop looking at his pretty girlfriend before turning around into sweet chin music. Sean shrugs, pins him, then turns back to his team and asks, who was that? Team DX confer, I think his name was Mike Knox, an ECW guy, but was he in the match? Oh, uh, yeah, I think so. Oh, so we're doing good then. It was really subtle and understated, but completely devastating. The whole match would turn into a bit of a comedy parade for Team DX as they knocked off every single member of Team Rated RKO without losing a single man. Number nine, Canaanites. It's been a long and winding road from Kane's debut as a mute, burn-riddled monster to the friendly mayor of Knox County, Tennessee. 1997 was definitely the most definitive, powerful version of Kane, and slowly but surely, WWE made him more and more human. They let him talk, they gave him a different singlet that showed off his big red nips, then they removed the mask, let him grow a Republican haircut, and wear nice, approachable slacks. Depending on what you want from Kane, his Canaanites promo when he teamed with Rock and Hogan was either the best or the worst thing to happen to Kane in 2002. Oh wait, Katie Vick happened in 2002, scratch that. Anyway, on the March 28th episode of SmackDown, which is technically still at you era, but f**k off, no it isn't, Kane finds The Rock and newly face Hollywood Hogan. What happens next is something truly special. Kane asks Rock if he's ready, then tells him, it doesn't matter if you're ready, then cuts a Hogan promo about the 20,000 Canaanites in the crowd before cracking out all of Hogan's famous poses. Yes, Kane loses a certain something in this promo, but goddamn if the devil's favorite demon doing a perfect rock and then Hulk Hogan impression isn't funny as slightly burned balls. Number eight, Mr. America's lie detector. Can Hulk Hogan do comedy? Answer, sort of. Kind of? How to explain Mr. America to make it not sound shit. So Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon had a match at WrestleMania 19, which was oddly good as far as grandpa death matches go. It had Roddy Piper in it, always nice to see. After that match, Hogan was in kayfabe ordered to sit out the rest of his contract at home, but re-emerged in May 2003 as Mr. America, who wore a Captain America mask, but it wasn't a breach of copyright because he wasn't a captain. Captain Peanut Butter isn't the same as Mr. Peanut Butter, is he, idiot? So Mr. America appeared, wrestled like Hulk Hogan, came to the ring to Hulk Hogan's entrance theme and looked exactly like a more suable version of the Hulkster. No one on the show cared, leaving Vince McMahon to run around WWE like Frank Grimes running around the power plant trying to convince everyone that Mr. America was Hogan. The peak of the stupid but actually quite winsome angle, this was the first time Hogan had done something actually new since 1996, was a lie detector test where Mr. America was strapped up and forced to answer questions and before you ask, yes it's exactly like that scene from The Simpsons. Mr. America somehow a is the test because Hulk Hogan has always believed his own bullshit, I guess. So Vince straps himself into the chair to prove it's fake. And it's actually funny. If you're going to steal, you might as well steal from the best. Number seven, the trial of Eric Bischoff. Nothing says thanks for all your years of service like a nice retirement party. Some people get a gold watch. Eric Bischoff, general manager of Raw, got humiliated for an entire episode, had all the worst things he ever did repeated back to him in an honest to God trial before being AA'd and carted away in a garbage truck. Future endeavors 
and all that. The trial ran through the entire episode of Raw December 5th, 2005 and had some real highlights, including Coachman's opening statement for the defense being that his client was an asshole, Mick Foley as head of prosecution bringing a Batman lunchbox to the ring instead of a briefcase and adding Mr. Socko to his prosecutorial team, Chris Masters as the incredibly oily court bailiff, Vince shouting shut up instead of overruled, and even Maria paying off a months-long angle of her being dumb by actually delivering incredibly articulate testimony. It's surprisingly well acted from everyone, especially Vince who had not yet begun the overacting himself into a prolapse era of his career that he would swiftly and nightmarishly embrace in his feud against the Almighty. Raw always works best with a strong A plot running throughout and this was possibly the best example of that in the entire Ruthless Aggression era. Number 6. Paul Heyman Ruins JBL There's been a number of great Paul Heyman promos in WWE history. I'm a particular fan of the Brock Lesnar is really good promo. Have you heard that one? I kid, like a dick, because Heyman may genuinely be the best or at least most reliable promo in wrestling history. His greatest work, of course, took place at ECW One Night Stand 2005. Hey, it's my first WrestleTalk list to feature ECW One Night Stand 2005. Well, here we are again. It's always such a pleasure. During the show, which again is great, you should watch it, Heyman takes to the ring to deliver an emotional incendiary sermon on the mount as a natural sequel to his infamous f*** you, you're wrong, f*** you, we're right rallying cry from ECW's first pay-per-view. And best of all, he dunks on the entire main roster in hilarious fashion. He slams Bischoff for their not being a WCW reunion show, mentions two words to Edge, Matt freaking Hardy, to which everyone responds, that's three words, including Edge doing Matt's V1 gesture. But the greatest is Heyman telling JBL, who'd been getting steadily drunker throughout the show and recording his own alternate commentary to it, which is... Well, it's a listen. Heyman tells him, the only reason you were WWE champion for a year is because Triple H didn't want to work Tuesdays. To paraphrase Nietzsche, wrestling God is dead. Bonus JBL moment, did you know that in February 2005, SmackDown did a show in Tokyo? In that show, JBL came down to the ring with an inflatable dinosaur whilst pretending to be high off his tits on a tranquilizer dart, proceeding to insult, quote, Godzilla, whilst he stripped down to his underwear. Ruthless aggression. Number five, sexy Kurt. It wouldn't be a list of funniest moments without Kurt and making a tom tit of himself. God, he's the best. So, the greatest match at WrestleMania 21 by a country mile was Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels. It was a culmination of a pretty great feud between the two men that started when HBK alley oop Kurt in the Rumble. With Michaels being on Raw and Angle being on SmackDown, the two traded back and forth with the traditional sneak attack by Brand Invader thing, but also Kurt took it upon himself to accomplish everything Michaels had in his entire career, but faster and with more looking like a tom tit. He demolished a local competitor in a ladder match, winning it faster than Shawn did. He beat Marty Jannetty in a match with, shall we say, lots of rest holds. And best of all, March 24, 2005, came to the ring in Shawn Michaels' cosplay with HBK's former manager, Sensational Sherry, to sing his own version of Michaels' entrance theme. It is magnificent, and I will now read the lyrics in their Sondheim besting entirety. I think I'm cute. I've got gold medals. I've got the moves that make them all tap out. Kurt is slapping his ass at this point. The angle slam. The ankle lock. Marty Jannetty still can't walk. I'm just just a sexy Kurt, sexy Kurt, I'll make your ankle hurt, ankle hurt. I'm just a sexy Kurt, sexy Kurt, I'll make your ankle hurt, ankle hurt. If music be the food of love, that food would be a big egg singing a song about how he's a sexy Kurt. Number four, price check on a jackass. At Vengeance 2001, Booker T cost Steve Austin the undisputed championship and so began the haunting of Booker T. The rattlesnake went on a protracted campaign of ambushing Booker T in various places in a bingo hall. Hall, a as in Austin 316, what responds the old ladies around him, then into a church where Booker pretends to be a priest hearing confessions, but the best segment of all was on SmackDown December 13th when Austin lays a Waitrose quality beatdown on Booker T in a supermarket. For our American listeners, Waitrose is like the Whole Foods of the- oh wait, they have a Whole Foods in the UK. A Whole Foods quality beatdown. It's easily one of the best backstage brawling segments of all time as the two men roam around the Bakersfield Green Frog Market causing a shoot $10,000 in property damage. Highlights are many, including Austin asking Booker if he wants ketchup with that ass whooping while spraying him with ketchup, singing That's Amore before nailing him with the stiffest pizza shot in wrestling history, taking time out from wheeling Booker around in a shopping trolley to have a beer, Austin being locked in a milk fridge and emerging from the other side like a pasteurized Terminator, and finally, the perfect punchline, putting Booker on the checkout conveyor before leaving shouting, price check on a jackass. None of the wacky themed hardcore matches that WWE air every Halloween and Christmas 
Christmas even come close to replicating the beautiful chaos of the supermarket brawl. Number 3. Rock Me Like a Hurricane Steve Austin's final match still to this day is the underrated Rock Austin 3 at WrestleMania 19, when Rock returned for a brief but glorious stint as a Hollywood dickhead heel in 2003. It is, and this is a hill I'm willing to die on, the best few months of The Rock's career from a promo standpoint. After ruling as a super tough, never back down babyface for the last four years, Rock finally gets to cut loose and take his character in a snivelling new direction, and it produced some utter magic. One of the most surprising being a micro feud between The Rock and definitely not the Green Lantern, legally and explicitly not the Green Lantern, the Hurricane. February 24th, they met for the first time in a backstage segment with Rock calling him the Hamburglar and Hurricane responding with the one superhero he could definitely beat being the Scorpion King. It was a short, tiny little weird success, but both men liked working with each other, so they did it again and again. Hurricane hid in the Rock's dressing room. Rock called Hurricane a hundred pounds of nothing, five feet nothing, took a phone call. Hey, it's nothing. He says he knows you. The Hurricane would pretend to fly out of each segment and The Rock would sell it by looking off into the sky. He asked if Hurricane is going to throw a chicken McNugget at The Rock before the two face off in a match on Raw, which ends with, no joke, Hurricane beating The Rock after an Austin distraction. Bonus Hurricane moment, that time he tried to choke slam Triple H and Steve Austin the same time in the 2002 Royal Rumble. God, the Hurricane was brilliant. Number two, Stan. DX's reunion in 2006 was a mixed bag, and that bag was full of dicks. After electrifying the 90s with their edgy humor, the, quote, zany antics of the two Dadly Boys felt more like Triple H and Michaels had typed super funny jokes into Google and went with the first few clicks. They dressed up like Vince and Shane, drew I love cocks in a speech bubble next to the chairman, bought a t-shirt with a cock on it, drenched the McMahon in a spirit squad, and human shit. Look, I'm not saying the original DX was Shakespeare, although now I want to see that more than anything, but it wasn't this. However, that being said, number 10 on this list proved there was still some good stuff in the 2006 DX run, and this was by far the best. Backstage at Cyber Sunday 2006, Sean is complaining about people saying that DX isn't controversial anymore, a startling moment of self-awareness from Vincent K's Blade Parade. Looking to prove otherwise, Michaels turns to the man next to him. Hey look kids, it's Ty Sean Spears Dillinger. Ask him his name, he says Stan, and HBK kicks his whole head off saying, see, I just kick Stan, before storming off down the corridor, kicking two more people as he goes. It isn't very clever, but it's slapstick at its absolute finest. Number one, Sacramento Rock Concert. Heel 2003 Rock is the best. I love him so, so much. Part of the joy of the character was that in his prime, Face Rock had cut scathing promos on pretty much every member of the company, but the one target to constantly evade that scorn was the fans. Not anymore. In 2003, Rock pretty much destroyed every town he passed through, like, well, a hurricane. Rock was as good at working a crowd as ever, but instead of drawing huge pops, he drew heat, the likes of which you so rarely see today. Genuinely, only that freak segment where Owens and Elias ragged on the Sonics has ever matched up to the heat of Rock's 2003 run. There are so many contenders to pick from. Rock and Toronto mocking them for reacting to their hometown. We live in Toronto! Yay! Hooray! Or saying, stronger than a bear, faster than the buck, the biggest thing to hit Canada because the maple leaves suck to an unbelievable amount of booze. But the clincher has to be the Rock concert in Sacramento. March 24th, the go home roar before Mania 19, he bags on them beautifully, saying the best thing about being in Sacramento is that in an hour, he's going to leave Sacramento, and then sings a song which, and I cannot fathom this, has been cut from the WWE Network. He sings, I'm leaving Sacramento, Sacramento I won't stay, but I'll be sure to come back when the Lakers beat the Kings in May, and it's one of the loudest heel reactions of all time. It is so great. Also, huge bonus points for it looking like Stone Cold was going to interrupt proceedings, but for a brief time, it actually turns out to be the hurricane again. Now that is some long-term booking. It's fantastic heel heat, but thinking about it, it might not actually be the best because someone else took a city to school in the Ruthless Aggression era. Secret bonus entry unlocked. Number zero, who's your daddy, Montreal? We've discussed Michael's brief heel run in the heel turns a backfired list just a few weeks ago. Why not watch that again? Show it to your family, confuse your parents. But it did give rise to possibly the best f*** you local crowd segment of all time. Shawn Michaels has never been popular in Montreal ever since the screw job and him turning heel to fight Hogan before a raw taping in Montreal 2005 was unreasonably perfect timing. What did WWE do to deserve such luck? Michael shows up and growls, who's your daddy, Montreal? And the booing never stops from there. Some say the fans are still booing Shawn Michaels to this day. He does an awful version of the Canadian national anthem, talks about screwing Bret Hart and the most beautiful bit of healing 
moment possibly in WWE history has Bret Hart's music play to a thunderous pop, of course the hitman isn't there, and that happiness turns to cruel and bitter and very real hatred. Shawn Michaels is the world's greatest son of a bitch. And that's our list. What's your favorite funny memory from the Ruthless Aggression era? Is it about Vince and Cox? Let us know in the comments and please like and share this video around. Don't forget to subscribe and don't forget it's Sunday, which means you can check out the latest episode of No Rolls Barred over at Parts Fun Known.